Hi everyone, welcome back to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. Today I'm talking a few different subjects, but I'm very excited for this interview. Um, I'm going to be talking about multiple food sensitivities, histamine issues, emotional freedom technique, and the importance of gut health. And my guest is Teresa Piella. So for those who don't know, Teresa is the founder of Living Roots Wellness. She is a colon hydrotherapist by training, and she now works as an independent health researcher and brain rewiring coach. Teresa holds space for one-on-one and group coaching, emphasizing brain rewiring and EFT tapping for those with complex histories of gut, brain, and trauma disorders. She focuses on supporting the most complicated cases of chronic illness that may have lost hope and the ability to connect joy as a result of the illness. With pro-metabolic nutrition, learning to truly embody safety at the level of the nervous system and release inherited and stored trauma, she empowers her clients with simple tools to reclaim their elegance, confidence, and strength, and to ultimately heal themselves. So welcome to the podcast, Teresa. Thanks, Vivian. Good to finally meet you. You too. And your health journey, like mine, has been a journey. So could you start off by telling the audience a little bit about what you've been through over the past few years? Yeah, thank you for asking. I'm always trying to simplify it and just get straight to the point, but I feel like I came into this world a little bit sickly and now looking back, my understanding has grown, just understanding that the state of the mother, her mineral balance, the trauma that she's going through, even her lifestyle is already wiring the HPA axis of the developing fetus. So I feel like I came into the world pretty frazzled, pretty fried, pretty anxious, and my health started to go downhill from a very early age. I remember as early as second grade, just feeling so profoundly fatigued, bloated. The world felt dark. I was really, really sensitive to everything, especially lighting, the classic seasonal affective disorder. It felt like I lived under a cloud. And just as we were talking about in terms of lifestyle, I was raised with a kind of in a pressure cooker environment where it was really competitive. The school systems we were growing up up in was all about being the best, being the top of the class, doing more, you know, achievement in every possible way. And it always felt rushed and overwhelming to me. So yeah, really starting in second grade was when I first started noticing symptoms, but just went downhill from there. And the, class der- the classic Western approach at the time was just to medicate me. So I was put on Prilosec for my heartburn, antibiotics for my ear infections, later put on birth control with the uh, promise that it would actually support my bone growth, which makes no sense now that we actually <laughs> understand how estrogen works. Um, later getting on high doses of Prozac, which I was told again, was something I would be on for life some sleep medications and just kind of starting to pile on the mess in tandem with living very dysfunctionally. This was probably in high school where again, I was so stressed out, completely under eating, falling into more of the vegan, vegetarian, but also fast food approach thinking, and by fast food, I mean, processed food, processed junk food, thinking that, you know, it was somehow going to help me feel better a lot of, you know, emotional eating as well, trying to feel better. So multiple layers here. And I'd say it hit a point in college where it felt like I had finally figured it out. I had finally gotten my first Lyme test back showing positive results for Babesia, Bartonella, um, a couple of other co-infections, some weird names like Chlamydia pneumoniae, which is actually a tick infection. And then as you know, it's, it's pretty comorbid with a lot of other layers of dysfunction. So you never really just have Lyme. You also tend to have parasites. You also tend to have a body that's really rich in heavy metals, in, you know, mold, in the resultant hormonal imbalances. So we had this perfect storm and I was excited because it felt like finally I was able to pinpoint why I felt so darn miserable and had a way out. But little did I know that the whole functional approach to healing these types of diseases was about to put me in an even deeper hole than I had found myself in. So I removed dairy, I removed gluten, I removed seeds, I removed nuts and was basically living in a very, uh, I guess, like a fearful, 
state where I felt completely removed from normalcy. I felt so fatigued that I couldn't really function the way I want to and just went downhill. The more supplements I took, the more doctors I saw, the worse I got, the more fearful my thoughts became. So it wasn't until it wasn't until a couple of years ago where I hit kind of a breaking point where my body was genuinely reacting to every food. And at this point, I was mostly eating just plant-based foods uh, with the most intense reactions and then switched the elemental formula. I'm not sure. Do they, they probably have a similar formula where you are, yeah. but it's basically a, a rest- like the most restrictive thing that you can yeah. go with, honestly. Yep. It's yeah. Amino acids. It has a little bit, you know, synthetic vitamins, a little bit of MCT oil, and it's basically a powder that you mix, (laughs) you mix with water and you sip throughout the day. And yeah, I think that was my breaking point when I realized even as I reacted to that, I just felt hopeless. My body weight had dropped down to about 79 pounds, which is very, very small for someone that's almost five, five. And you know, I felt completely like the, the just a waste to society. And I know that's not true. Looking back, if anything, I, you know, I think with the awareness now of, wow, I was actually trying so hard just to survive, but the body wasn't quite working, realizing so many factors were kind of keeping me stuck. And it was finally starting to, well, two things happened. I shifted to a carnivore diet with this idea that, okay, if I can't handle any foods right now, I'm going to go with the most nourishing, most low toxin food I can find. And granted, I still was reacting to that, but not as intensely. So that was my first little mini leg up. I had stopped seeing doctors at this point, because again, just getting vitamin infusions and injections and all those things were really not helping, really not helping at all. Um, And then actually that's when I started using more of the brain rewiring tools more, more in a more focused way. And I think the synergy with feeling just a little bit better, having a little bit less fermentation and endotoxin, just poisoning my system, because that's something I didn't mention, actually. Thank you for letting me talk in circles, but in the process of becoming sicker and sicker and sicker. And I think the high doses of antibiotics I took for the original Lyme disease diagnosis really contributed to this, but I lost all gut motility, including stomach emptying motility. So whatever food I put in was stuck basically. So I would eat because I was hungry and then get pretty intense swelling. And what I describe as like a flu-like reaction where I'd start to get really, really dizzy. And just, I mean, if anyone's ever had the flu, you kind of know what it feels like. It's like that, but intensified and you just, your whole body kind of feels a little bit, a little bit out of it. So colon hydrotherapy was another critical piece because while I was trying to figure out how the heck to get my gut to move on its own, that at least provided some temporary relief so that I could function or or have, you know, an hour or two of feeling normal and not so, not so toxic. So yeah, kind of a windabout way of learning to question a lot of the narratives I was told too, because I think even a lot of the naturopaths I had seen so genuinely believed in their approach, but so many of the supplements that they were dolling out just again, contributed to the problem. There's so many fillers and, you know, even a lot of the herbs have a lot of um, hormonal influences that we have to honor. Yeah, so they're contaminated with heavy metals. and. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I, I really question. So I, t- today I feel like supplements are nothing to mess around with. And like, it's, they're not regulated in the same way. And not to say that regulation is, you know, what makes it safe, but ooh, I'm so much more about starting to notice, okay, what's going on with the brain? How are we thinking about the body and our health? Because here's a big thing throughout the journey. I was so upset with my body. I couldn't believe, you know, it was letting me down. I thought it, it looked really scary. I kind of looked alien-like, like E.T., if you've ever seen that movie, just so removed and, and terrified of what was going on. I felt completely at the whims of this, you know, almost like a prison that I lived in. But as I started to really look at my own thoughts, that was maybe one of the first things realizing, oh my gosh, my body is trying so hard to heal. It wants to heal. It's 
trying tremendously to make energy and you know all these things were pretty much preventing that process so that was basically like a this explosion of starting to notice okay I want to be thinking in ways that are supportive to my experience and not in a bright sighting way sometimes that was just acknowledging that I was feeling scared and hopeless and removed from life and I could still take one step beyond that and say, and I know I'm doing my best and starting to work on that level. So yeah, that's the journey in a nutshell. Wow. And how long ago was this, by the way? And how old are you now? So I am um, 29 now and I started getting sick. Yeah. In, in second grade, but the, the bulk of my Lyme disease treatment was when I was a junior in college and then steadily went downhill from there and, you know, continued trying to find answers, but just losing strength, losing, losing the will to live really the more, the more doctors I saw, especially being turned away from some healers, just saying, we don't know what to do with you, you know, like just that feels overwhelming. Yeah, I can imagine that's <laughs> never a good feeling when they're like, we don't know. The next expert is like, I don't know what to do. Yep. Yeah. But you still figured it out. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't do it alone. I was, I have a, an amazing partner that stuck by my side and actually took a leave of absence from his work to be with me because there were months and months where I just, you know, the biggest task of the day was going for a little walk around my neighborhood. And then we'd, you know, I'd come home and drink my elemental shake and be basically laying on the floor, wondering what the point of this experience mm -hmm. was and his patience and just having someone to distract me and that was part of the brain rewiring to focus on the beautiful things around me so I wasn't so hyper focused on the sensitivity of my body um you know a really loving mom and friends kind of came out of the cracks too which was amazing people I hadn't I'd lost contact with because you know I wasn't really traveling I wasn't doing the the normal young person thing uh meeting up for any events so people would come and visit me and that would give me something to look forward to a little burst of inspiration so it all played a role the support system and community is key yeah. even with the last couple of years that we've had people uh being mindful of their immune system yet they're locked away in the homes and no wonder that people come out of it with poor immune systems and are more overweight and sicker and faster than ever oh my gosh and i mean the studies on isolation and yeah. its impact on What's yeah smoking, immune function but yeah, exactly. It's, it's kind of crazy, but again, you have to realize how terrible you can feel to then realize that there is another way. And a lot of what is preached about, you know, from kale smoothies to, you know, even just certain like exercise regimens, when you really start to experience that there is another way to be a human that can actually allow you to feel amazing. It's th that opens up so much hope. And, oh, I should add the work of Dr. Ray Pete has tremendously impacted my healing as well because his his I guess it's more of like a philosophy it's more of a way of, of living but he provided a, a beautiful transition out of a carnivore lifestyle because again that never felt sustainable it was more like okay this is my last hope I at least can survive on eating just meat but it was never something I wanted to do long term so when I started to dive more into his work on what it means to have a functioning cell, why the mitochondria is so important, why the thyroid is so important. More hope in terms of, oh, wait, doctors aren't talking about this, but it makes sense to me. And I'm getting data points that I'm feeling better following these ideas. So that was huge. I have to always mention him because he's, he's starting to become pretty popular, which I think is great because he is this like hope dealer for a lot of people that just need to find their own way. I was going to ask, I know you follow more of that pro-metabolic way of eating um, and definitely just focus on nutrient-dense foods and the whole blood sugar balance piece. But um, yeah, I was going to ask like why that specifically, what is your current diet philosophy and how do you, do you see it as a different thing than you've done before? Because you've been on these diets previously and some people could say, oh, it's just another diet. Like it's not going to be a long-term thing. Like how is this one different, do you feel? Yeah, I think it's more individualized in terms of it's finding what doesn't irritate your gut what's the most absorbable the most mineral rich the most anti-inflammatory in the sense of you know honoring the copper and iron and things like phosphorus to calcium ratio 
honoring that a lot of plants have anti-nutrients plants and seeds and nuts and legumes even when they're eaten in, in too heavy amounts and really honoring that fruits and really digestible meats and eggs and even dairy can have a beautifully calming and from you know thyroid promoting energy metabolism promoting effect on the body so I, yeah, I, I wouldn't call it another diet because I think people can easily fall into, oh, this is pro-metabolic. I'll eat this, you know, I'll have my diet or my Coke and my beef. And that's a perfect meal. I would argue, well, there's other ways to do that. <laughs> you know, a, a Coke might actually be less harmful than having a kale smoothie, depending on the state of someone's gut. So that was kind of mind blowing for me to realize, but it really is coming back to eating frequently to, it's like a, to sum it up, it would be what's the most anti-stress diet for your unique body? And are you eating enough? Are you getting enough protein for proper liver function? Are you having normal and regular bowel movements to actually excrete so many of the byproducts and hormones that need to be coming out of us? So yeah, it's more of a framework for, for supporting the body, which again, I think is kind of missing from the mainstream approach of so many of these foods that to me actually look beautiful. Like I think a beautiful salad and all the colors of, you know, raw vegetables, I think they're gorgeous, but these days I think they're less appropriate for human consumption. And the more sensitive the gut, the more you're going to feel how <laughs> inappropriate certain foods are. But there's also people out there who take it to the extreme and they start to label some of these foods like I know the poofers, the polyunsaturated fats as poisons and we need to avoid them. You can't ever be exposed to them again. Otherwise, you're going to um, wreck your thyroid function and cause all of this inflammation in the body. So I know you're not in that extreme um, mindset, but there are people out there. So I know with your history of restriction um, mm -hmm. for your health issues and trying to heal, you're very mindful not to demonize foods and have that association good or bad or um, healthy or not so could you talk a little bit more about how you've gone from extremely restricted diets such as carnivore to be able to eat some of these foods um, and yeah some tips on helping people navigate expanding their diet yeah that's a good question because I think the road out is pretty bumpy because as we were talking about before there is so much fear when you've been having really intense mast cell activation to certain foods you might want to eat something like an orange or chocolate or a banana, simple foods. And the body can be mounting huge responses, which feel really defeating. So part of what helped me out of it was genuinely bringing a sense of humor. You know, it's as I started, the first foods I started adding back in were actually carrots, orange juice, and maple syrup when I started to try and increase what I was eating aside from just beef and chicken and eggs. Um, and it was not easy at first, but if I could distract myself, you know, be listening to music, setting the scene with a candle, even sometimes watching a cooking show with something beautiful that I wish I could have eaten to distract from what I was genuinely eating in the moment, that was sometimes enough to expand my awareness and make the mood feel a little bit lighter. But with the intense reactions to even adding foods back in, the more I could just surrender and just say, okay, it is what it is. Trusting that my body was trying, trusting that the cells were actually trying to protect me. It just, you know, all these faulty signaling, what happens when our gut has been leaking for so long. It's like every food becomes an allergen or every food becomes deemed an invader. But yeah, really just learning to surrender and not adding extra suffering because when the body's already reacting, it's if we're panicking, oh no, oh no, what's this gonna mean? I won't be able to do this. I'm gonna be sick forever, blah, blah, blah. All of the layers that we add, that just heightens the whole picture. So if, if people are working on adding foods back in and they're terrified and they're noticing, oh my gosh, I'm scared to even sit down and eat because of this, starting right in that moment of, okay, what would be ideal for you? How do you want to feel approaching food? And it was really thinking more about that. I started to realize, well, I'd rather just be kind of relaxed and goofy and peaceful about it. If I was going to have a reaction anyways, I might as well take a little bit of responsibility and, and just float through it. You know, maybe still pretty sick, especially with certain fruits. Those were the hardest, I think, things like apple and watermelon 
to this day are kind of, kind of tricky, but you know, not, not complicating it. So, you know, and some of Ray Pete's approaches actually were really, really helpful too, because I didn't realize that even just the high amounts of fat on say a carnivore or more of a keto carnivore approach completely blocks the ability to utilize glucose. So that was a big thing that can signal the response from the mast cells, realizing that I needed to retrain my cells to be not so insulin resistant and to be more glucose sensitive. So starting to pay more attention to things like, I, I, I see it as an adaptogen, but something like coffee that can help to signal the cell to pull in that glucose to make energy and things like getting the B vitamins back up or even favoring more of the the gelatin rich foods and the amino acids like proline, glutamine, and glycine have a very different effect on the body than just eating pure muscle meat. Things that I didn't really know about when I was just trying to survive and, you know, didn't really have the mental capacity to figure that out. So yeah, I was starting to really honor the mindset, how that impacts digestion and then starting to use functional little, I call them kitchen hacks because they're, they're less like a it's less like in the biohacking world where they're taking all those nootropics. It's more about, okay, we are starting to understand how the cell makes energy. How can we support that process? What are the really basic building blocks to allow the cell to create as much energy as possible? So, so but really the mindset. Yeah, the mm -hmm. mindset is everything. I mean, going into the meal, like I've had times where I've given myself a histamine reaction just with my thoughts. Like if you're going into the meal, freaking out, whatever your thing is, like, if it's going to yeah. break you out the next day or if you're going to get diarrhea later on or if you're going to get a histamine like kind of flush response it probably will happen because you've manifested that in your mind you know and you you said this before we started recording but i think it's important just even being grateful and saying wow okay this imagining this food absorbing well imagining that your body's going to extract as much nutrition as it can that sets such a beautiful cascade of relaxation where the body's like, yes, okay, I can digest this versus, oh, I'm not going to digest this. This is toxic. Da, 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 da. You know, I, I firmly believe that someone can live off of a less than ideal diet, but if they're living a life of joy and gratitude and play and they're making music and they're having fun and they feel connected, they're probably going to have such a better gut function. They're, they're going to be robust in so many ways versus the person that's even eating a perfectly digestible meal, but freaking out about it and, and assuming that it's going to cause all sorts of reactions. So yeah, just being even grateful for, wow, thank goodness we have access to grass-fed meats. Wow, thank goodness we have access to fresh squeezed orange juice the basic things that are so easy to take for granted when we're in a fearful state, we forget that even having food is such a gift. I even said that to a client last week. You just reminded me that my diet now is probably the least on paper healthy than it's ever been. Cause I'm going out to eat at restaurants and my boyfriend's a trained chef. So I'm making the most of his, uh, his skills. Um, and yeah, just the fact that now I'm way less reactive to foods. I mean, there's still some things I need to be mindful of because um, of the ongoing mass activation but yeah now I'm enjoying food and I've been at the, the point a few years back where I was taking Tupperware tubs of food to restaurants or turning down invitations just to stay at home and eat by myself and I thought I was trying to be healthy then but now I'm way healthier because of the fact that I'm um, in a loving relationship and I have a community and I'm enjoying life a little bit more. Yeah that's it you know I think there's been I think it was Ray Pete actually who first mentioned this, but this idea that the less we're researching our health conditions, the less we're hyper-focused on perfection and the more we're living our lives and seeking novelty and inspiration and almost getting lost in the wonder of the world around us, it has a bi-directional effect. Not only are we naturally feeling better, so we're able to engage in those things, but they're so healing in ways that we can't even begin to pinpoint, but there's something about reconnecting with that that humanness again when we're we're less about a person with diseases that needs to stay home and eat the perfect meal and we're more about oh wow okay i'm gonna live my life anyways that opens up so much uh, i guess it builds up the resiliency and you know the body starts to remember oh wow this is a pretty cool place to be for a short amount of time let's have some fun 
Definitely. And I think people get stuck in these habits and even with food, if they've reacted to something in the past, they're fearful, fearful to try it again, but the body is constantly shifting. So just a reminder to people, if you tried something a few months back and it didn't work, try it again now. And don't, don't be set on telling your brain that that's a bad food for you. And with what you said before, maybe um, a sirloin steak um, in terms of beef is a problem, but a slow cooked um, stew is different because of the different amino acid or maybe with oranges versus orange juice. Maybe you'll react to the fiber and the pulp aspect of the whole orange, but it's fine with juice because those fibers have been removed and you absorb it way better. So it might be the same food, but you have a different response to it. So it's worth trying uh, cooked versus uncooked even. Yes, and really good point on the nuance too, because I think again in the wellness world, it's like uncooked is better. Like the more fiber, the better, but not necessarily. It was actually on a fiber list diet, which blew my mind. Mm -hmm where again, I started to get some regularity back in my gut, but, you know, even honoring, oh, you know, a cooked applesauce, very different than trying to eat a raw apple. And, oh, are you combining that applesauce with some protein and some fat, or are you just trying to eat an apple plain? That's going to have a completely different effect on the body. And that's, I think, part of the fun of figuring out what works for you, but also the body seems to the body seems to know what makes sense and it's really forgetting what we've been told and starting to think, okay, what would the toddler version of me do? You know, they don't really overcomplicate it. I love watching little kids eat because they naturally like they grab the meat first and then maybe they'll munch on the fruit, but then they'll go off and play and then they'll come back and maybe they'll munch (laughs) a little bit more and they'll go off and play. And I feel like that's something that we've lost. Mealtimes have become so rigid and measured and yeah, just not, not, not as playful as they could be. Very good. Yeah. And with what you know now, looking back, do you feel like you could, you should have started with the brand new wearing stuff or was there a need for the Lyme protocols that you did or the um, restrictive diets, the carnivore, the elemental diet? Do you feel like it actually helped physiologically or do you feel like um, brain re- rewiring made the biggest difference? You know, I, in hindsight, I think honoring that I had pathways that were pretty dysfunctional and fear-based, some trauma loops from very early in life, just being a hypervigilant, highly anxious child. But I had to live in that way for long enough to realize that there was another way. And it wasn't until I started to fully feel the intensity of how certain thoughts would feel on a somatic level that it made sense to me that, whoa, you know, if the, the classic idea that if certain thoughts can make you sick, which we have, we have evidence of that, starting to realize, wow, joyful, creative thoughts or even distracting from the body in a, in a healthy way sometimes would give me these little bursts of energy. So, you know, I think I, I trust that the, the process looks the way it has to. And of course we think, oh, if only I knew that then, like, you know, thinking about the high doses of antibiotics that I was on for about seven months, like if only I knew then what I know now that that was not the first thing to try for Lyme's disease, of course, things would have unfolded differently, but I'm grateful that it went so disastrously because now I know how I can help other people maybe avoid making the same mistakes. And it's always inspiring to me to even meet some of the younger crowd who already know just innately how their thoughts influence their reality and how they, they are more in charge than they think. So Yeah, I think the carnivore diet, though, really was that stabilized me. And again, I would never recommend it. I don't think it's a long term. I don't think it's a longevity diet in the same way that a lot of the carnivore crowd makes it seem. But if someone is reacting to all the foods and their gut is so inflamed, and I just imagine a gut with basically big holes in it and all the plants we're eating is are basically, you know, ripping it apart. I think it can be a really nice break. And as you probably know too, even just removing carbs, while not a long-term solution, it does heighten cortisol in the body because the body's like, okay, we got to get this glycogen from somewhere. But I think that short burst of a cortisol boost basically does have some Mm anti-inflammatory effects in the same way that you give someone a cortisone injection and you know, they're good to go. So yeah, I think that everyone's journey will look a little different, but if they're in the point at the phase where it just feels overwhelming and hopeless, 
knowing that they'll look back on this and say, oh, okay, I had to go through it that way. There's so much richness in, in the moments that feel unbearable where you realize it's, it's almost prepping you to be, to be stronger and to look back and realize, okay, if I can made it through that, no problem looking forward especially going through things at a younger age when all of your friends are off to college and like living their lives. Sometimes I've felt, I'm sure you did as well, like you're left behind or why me? You get into this victim mentality, mm-hmm. but I feel like I've dealt with pretty much any health symptom you can think of just so now I can help others and speed up the healing process for them and help them not spend the obscene amount of money that I've spent along the way. Yes, Vivian. And sometimes I, I've even talked to my husband about this, but it feels I feel so driven from a sense of purpose to really like reach out to the people that are losing hope that are completely maybe in the darkest place and just feeling like, what's the point of all this? My task feels like to be, to be the one to say, Hey, I know it's scary and there is the other side and it might not look anything like you thought it would. So I think, yeah, there's something beautiful about realizing, wow. Okay. It was pretty terrible going through that. And thank goodness, because now I know exactly what I want to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> Hindsight really is twenty twenty. And someone might not want to be a practitioner like we are, but it could yeah. be that they get themselves healthy to go and care for their family or go and excel in their career that they want to do. So it doesn't have to look exactly the same as someone else's path. But yeah, I, I truly believe that there's a silver lining in the struggle. But with your traumas and some of the emotional um, suppression that you had, you you are a really big fan of EFT now why did you choose that above other modalities like tap uh, like um, Reiki or breath work or EMDR that are some common ones too so I think it was what resonated with me specifically but I tried everything I tried EMDR I tried hypnosis I tried seeing different shamanic healers I really all you know guided meditations I tried breath work I tried Reiki. I literally, whatever was on the table, I was desperate to feel better. And to be fair, I think certain healers with the unique energy they give off, I would feel a sense of lightness around them. You know, I thinking of Reiki, for example, I remember seeing this woman back in college and I genuinely would feel better, but it never felt like it lasted. Like I would still fall back into the same thought patterns of despair, of hopelessness, of like you said, why me? Of, oh my gosh, it's never going to get better. Or, oh my gosh, I can't eat this food or else. And just talk, really, I don't, I don't really, I don't really like the word, like a negative thought, but you, in terms of the thoughts that really don't really lead to anything, they don't really lead to anything except more of that Mm -hmm. darkness. So I was working with a coach, actually, she specialized in hypnosis and EFT. And I thought hypnosis, I thought EFT was pretty weird. I was so skeptical until I started having breakthroughs where I started to notice not only were my thoughts changing, but I felt like a different person. And that pairs really well with visualization, similar to the DNRS framework of projecting positive future visualizations. EFT is a big component of starting to notice, okay, the traumatized brain is going to assume the worst. That's part of the limbic dysfunction. If we can teach the brain to assume the best, realizing they are equally as likely, you know, whatever you start to really imagine, it's probably going to be what you find yourself in. That started to feel, yeah, it started to feel like the first way that I could finally take charge of my health that wasn't paying someone for their protocols or their supplements or even like sign up for my program and I'll fix you. It was more about, wow, moment to moment, I can start to question my thoughts change them, thank them. There's so many different ways of working, but EFT specifically, I think is really cool. And it's growing in popularity, it seems, but they're finding that even the specific acupressure points that, that you use during a sequence are an active ingredient in the healing modality. So mm-hmm. I think that's pretty cool because even just tapping without saying specific phrases can help shift the system back towards more of that parasympathetic state. And as we were talking about before with the food reactivity, that's, a, that's the biggest piece right there is if we can bring the body into a place of not being so sympathetic, being in that more restful at peace place, 
we are naturally going to be less reactive, as you mentioned too, like creating the reactions just because you're so afraid. So I think EFT is, is, is a way to empower yourself to heal. And, you know, the more you learn about what phrases resonate with you, the more you can start to do it on your own. And it's, it kind of meets you where you're at. It's not about I'm help, ha- happy and healthy and everything is working out in my favor. It's like, oh, wow. Okay. I'm definitely not happy or healthy. And I know I'm doing the best that I can. It start it starts to acknowledge. And I think acknowledging parts of the brain that are maybe have been shut down in the past sends more signals of peace. So I'm personally excited that it's growing in use and the research is really starting to take off because they're using it from everything from PTSD for people getting cancer treatments to people that have just, you know, gone through a pretty traumatic event and needing some support when they didn't expect to be dealing with any kind of brain dysfunction. So all sorts of things. I love it as well. And once you know how to do it, and I would like you to kind of talk through for those who aren't watching, just yeah. what to do. And they can obviously watch your videos as well on Instagram. But yeah, sometimes you're a 10 out of 10 stressed and then you do a round of tapping and then it goes down to an eight and then you do another and it's a seven. So results can be pretty immediate. And it is something that you can do multiple times a day as you sit down to eat a meal. It's not like you have to go to your therapist's um, a clinic can have an hour hypnotherapy session it can be in the moment as you need it as you're on the the train or the bus you can like just tap away and you don't have to say anything out loud you might look a bit of a crazy person like tapping your head and your wrists and everything but uh, it, I mean it does work and it's an amazing tool so could you talk us through maybe some mantras that you would use or some some common words or anything that you say during the tapping and the exact locations on the body Yes. So the food example is a great one. So say someone's terrified of eating a certain, maybe they're adding in one food and they're terrified. They're assuming it's going to make a terrible reaction. So I'd first start by kind of getting to know them, figuring out their history with food, but also thinking about how they'd like to feel around food. What is the change they would want to have? And most people say, I just want to relax. I just want to eat whatever and move on. Like they're at the point where they're like, I just want to be able to be free. I want to just eat and get back to living. So some of the initial phrases, you start off with what's called the karate chop point, but it's saying something like this, like, even though I'm terrified that this banana is going to cause a reaction, I'm learning to soften, knowing that my body is doing the best it can to help me heal. Or maybe something like, even though I'm scared that I'm going to be sick, if I eat this, I'm choosing to remember that my body's on my side and I'm ready to take that next step to get back to eating the way I want to. So little reframes. And then you're basically acknowledging the costs and the fear and the panic. And wow, I've been living this way for so long. I feel like I've missed out on seeing friends. I live in a state of panic. I've avoided social situations. I feel like a freak home alone, eating my perfect meals that I actually don't even look forward to. I spend my entire day thinking about food and for what I feel like crap, you know, all these things where you're basically acknowledging how much of a toll this has taken. And interestingly, by tapping on the points while acknowledging so-called negative statements deactivates the fear centers in the brain and allows for us to finally release we can think more critically about them think of the costs acknowledge wow yeah this is keeping me back from living the life i want and then within the sequence you start to shift you start to think about well i'm ready to take that next step even though i'm scared i'm ready to take to take a bite of some cheese because i'm ready to get back to being out with friends i care about being with friends and living my life I want to feel healthy and strong and carefree and starting to project forward. It's almost like a, in EFT, it's called like the lead. The practitioner will help the client to think, yeah, where is this? What, what's the beauty waiting for you? Yes, we know what it feels like to be stuck, but what if we start to open up possibilities? And that's where I think the magic is because all of a sudden, people start to feel, you start to feel maybe shivers or you start yawning or you start to feel the parasympathetic state take over. 
And I kid you not, I see that's where people start to realize as they visualize themselves, maybe adding in a food, they do it. They don't have a reaction. They're shocked. They're elated. They get that data point of, wow, maybe I can heal. And it just builds. So it's really the nuance of the situation, meeting the person where they're at, and then teaching them things that they can do on their own. So sometimes I even have people record the videos. They can rewatch them. Like you said, to keep bringing down that intensity Mm -hmm. from an eight to a seven to a two. And all of a sudden they're eating, you know, cheeseburgers at a fast food restaurant and not having reactions. And it's, it's amazing. But I think that experience is exactly what some people need to, to rebuild that hope. And if food sensitivities aren't your problem to listeners, you can adapt that to anything that's happening, stress, anxiety, work issues, relationship. Um, yeah, that's the beauty of it. Yeah, I think it's actually becoming pretty popular for like the weight loss community and even mm. like in terms of like money and business, which makes sense because, you know, it's there's always going to be a possibility for a thought to hold someone back. So if we can really look at that, maybe even understand how it formed and start to shift to, well, how, how would I like to be? How would I really like to move through this situation? There's so much power there because it's like the more creative you let it be, the more opportunities the brain starts to say, wow, I would, I want to feel energized and fun. And, you know, I, I want to be enjoying this day. And it, it's, it becomes like the it becomes like a like a blueprint for the brain to step into. And I'm glad that it's different than the regular positive affirmation world because that often doesn't work. That's why people like do it year after year and they don't really notice results because they're just telling themselves, I'm happy, I'm healthy, I'm abundant. But if you don't believe that or if you're not physically clearing the emotion from the body, the energy, then you haven't really dealt with the problem. So exactly. yeah, I'm glad that it makes a difference. It's kind of like when you're, saying out loud your frustrations it's like you're venting or writing in your diary and just releasing this anger which can often affect things like the liver or the throat chakra ah and yeah very good point because i think the trauma research is really showing that it gets stuck in the fascia it gets stuck in the organs it gets stuck in the tissues and we can actively remove that by literally changing our thoughts about something because even say you have a true reaction to a food and you freak out if we can program in the response of, wow, next time I, next time I eat a banana and say, I do get sick and I'm just going to laugh my way through it. I'm going to cuddle up in my pajamas and watch a movie. Very different reaction. Then the body starts to feel safe. And I know you mentioned DNRS and I think they do a really good job with some of the reframes, but it can feel debilitating to people thinking that they have to practice every time there's Mm. a trigger an hour a day that can feel more of this this trap of, wow, I'm sick. I'm home alone practicing my rounds versus, okay, let's reintegrate with life. Let's start doing the things that the healthy version of you would do, knowing that you're still working on things, but it's an opportunity. It's not this, it's not a prison that's holding you back. It's an opportunity to start to say, okay, I'm going to start being the person I want to be starting now and now and now. And to those listening, I was telling Teresa a little bit about my health journey and we've struggled with similar things. I had a lot of food sensitivities as well. And I heard about DNRS. I downloaded the program and did the initial like three day intro, but then I didn't actually stick with it because I knew that I wouldn't be able to, like, I was like, I'm not going to do two weeks of it and try because it's not going to notice. I'm not going to notice too much of a result at that point because of the time commitment. It just put me off. I'm not going to lie, but there are people I've got clients who it changed their life. They've gone from, Uh, major chemical sensitivities where they have to wear masks because of pollution and everything it's a no issues at all so it is an amazing tool but there's other things and it doesn't have to be this one time a day it can be sprinkled throughout the day with maybe a few rounds of tapping or when a symptom pops up you reframe some pain or a headache as your body trying to heal or push out some sort of toxin from the body yes yeah I think so much of what I learned from DNRS because I did it diligently for the six months, not, not really experiencing what I wish I did, but now looking back again, like you said, the, the reframe or what they call a poposite noticing, okay, if you're going to future forecast that you're going to be too fatigued to do anything. Oh, stop right there. Mm -hmm. Let's future forecast that you're going to have the appropriate amount of energy and really starting to notice how we're holding ourselves back. And we don't even realize it because we may so identify with being an anxious person or being, you know, like being someone that doesn't do certain things, but that is something that we can start to work with. And I think EFT 
takes it the final step because it starts to lock in. You really start to notice, wow, what if I am that person that sprints into the water and, you know, is the life of the party, whatever it is that you want to start to work on, even while you are working on symptoms, it's possible. And I feel like our conversation has really come full circle because everything that we spoke about today would lead to a healthier mother and therefore a healthier child. And then the likelihood of all of these things happening in the offspring is a lot less, maybe not completely um, risk-free because of the toxic world that we live in. But you were saying about um, having a nutrient dense diet, balancing your blood sugar, eating these mineral rich foods, dealing with emotional stress and trauma that we have locked away in our body, the importance of gut health and removing, uh, lowering these endotoxins and maybe irritating foods from our guts, um, considering colon hydrotherapy or enemas to get the bells going. That will all help with future fertility. I don't know about you, but I'm, even though I'm not thinking about kids for a good few years yet, everything that I've been doing over the past few years has ultimately helped my fertility. And even if you never want kids, then it's benefiting your long-term health and experiencing menopause or future disease risk too so yeah i thought we'd bring it full circle and bring it back to um, the generational aspect of health yeah absolutely and you just reminded me a big piece of my journey was also learning to question what we've been diagnosed with because it was about eight years ago i was diagnosed with early onset ovarian failure basically told i was infertile and then have since regained my fertility and this this feeling of, wow, if I had signed up for that and believed that really taken that on. Sure. I bet my body probably would have stayed in a maybe panic mode and the the ovaries would have just said, okay, yep. No energy here, but starting to say, well, what if I can heal? What if every part of my body is trying to regenerate and I can just very peacefully and intelligently support that, but not in an aggressive way, more in like, okay, I'm going to eat the foods I like really nutrient dense, eat the happy animals that are from farms nearby. The body is always trying to reorganize. We often just have to give it what it needs and start cheering it on, you know, really cheering it on. Such an important point. And even with my experience and my health issues, I do have to keep talking about it like on podcast um, episodes and with my clients, they'll ask me about my health history, but I really try not to identify with the labels I've been given or the health history, it doesn't, it isn't who I am. I am someone who has had those things in the past or is dealing with symptoms associated with them, but I'm not my uh, mold illness or my Lyme disease or anything like that. Because some people on online, particularly they'll be a moldy or a Lyme warrior and these things, which I mean, if it helps you with community and finding those through a hashtag those people who have struggled with similar thing that's fine but yeah try not to hold on to that diagnosis and that label because then that's just going to hold you back as well yeah and you remind me too just i think it's a buddhist idea but the idea that we are of the nature to get sick and to die awesome we're all in that together you know it's just part of being an animal a human you know if you even watch the deer or the rabbits they've got infections they have ticks they have all sorts of things but they're still cuddling with their loved ones. They're still romping around and prancing in the sun. So I think that's a big piece realizing, okay, you're a person working on some imbalances, but it's not you. And I, yeah, I think that's part of where we can really start to take our power back and say, okay, yes, there might be some spirochetes in my body, but am I a limey? No, I'm, I'm me. Okay, great. <laughs> and, and, and I love, you bring up such a good point, this idea of not needing to overemphasize what you're going through. I think it's amazing to even meet people that don't know anything about your health history and show up as the person that you are, whether it's, you know, sharing your kindness or your creativity and completely not talking about health, but more of like the inspirational side of just being a human. That can be a wonderful reframe for the brain where it realizes it doesn't have to hyper-focus on the supplements and the meal timing and, oh, did I do my infrared sauna and I got to do my castor oil pack and got to get exactly 10,000 steps to pump my lymph. And, you know, I better be taking my binders for my mold, but wait a second, the chlorella, I think it is heavy, you know, the, the chaos yeah. that we create for ourselves versus, ah, wow, I'm so happy to be alive in the sun. And I really appreciate the company of this person. And, you know, that's, I'd say that's the way we want to keep steering the brain. And I've been dating my boyfriend since February. So for the past nine months or whatever, he couldn't be further from 
the health notes yes. as in that I have been. So he, I don't think he'd ever like said gluten in his whole life as much as he has in the past nine months. <laughs> so he actually knows what gluten is now. And yeah, he doesn't take any supplements and he's pretty healthy. And I mean, he's like making me more aware of um, like not to be so focused on diet, the relationship side of things. And I mean, just enjoying life and going out every now and again till three in the morning, dancing at a nightclub yes. can be beneficial as well. And how beautiful that you have that mirror to yeah. pull you back to the more ideal state. I think that's amazing. It's like, I don't know who said this, but this idea that you're kind of the sum of the five people mm -hmm. you spend most of your time with. And so true. So true. If we're around people that are so inspired by life and they're doing cool things outside, they're making cool things and they're showing up with that kind of magnetism, that, that brilliance. Oh, let's follow more of that. So I'm really happy you have that in your life. I mean, I always thought I'd going to be with someone like the Ben Greenfields of the world, like biohackers, like really into the health and hunting this grass fed meat. But yeah, now I'm like, no, I actually don't think I'd enjoy that. I don't want someone who's the exact same as me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely relate. You know, I think, yeah, there's more to, there's more to life than getting too hyper-focused. And I know both of us enjoy the research but it feels like it's more of this like ooh, let's problem solve and then maybe we can help someone it's less about oh my gosh i'm sick i'm stuck oh, must no. yeah. detox must heal and i'm commonly <laughs> telling my clients like spend less time searching health like follow one or two people but i think you benefit benefit more from watching a comedy show or a funny movie rather than sitting on google and youtube searching for answers yeah absolutely and health is a journey. It's not a destination. I want to end with that, that quote, because I'm sure that people can relate. And even with us, even though we're so much better than what we were, it's just an ongoing, an ongoing thing that we're going to be working on. And that's a perfect reminder too, because I think we get so clenched and fearful trying to feel better, which comes from a very innocent and beautiful place. We want to feel better. We feel like life is on the other side. If we only feel better, then we can live. But that's maybe one of the other biggest reframes. If you can learn to have fun while you feel miserable, you start to feel better. You start to realize, wow, my life is right now. I can't wait until I'm healthy because that doesn't even exist in this world anymore. I'm sorry, but I haven't met a single perfectly healthy mm -hmm. person, maybe mentally, which yep. is amazing, but Same it's starting to, to really flip, flip the narrative. Okay. I'm going to live my life right now as if this were my last day, as if this were my last week. Would I be on the computer researching mast cell activation or would I be out dancing until three? I know what I'd prefer. <laughs> anyway, before I let you go, Teresa, there's a few questions I always ask my guests. So the first one is, is there a book that you would like to recommend on anything that we've spoken about today? So it could be the whole chronic illness world, gut health, the pro-metabolic nutrition. So it's, it's kind of like my Bible, but I read it right when I was starting to get very confused and hopeless. But even today as a very happy person, it's still one of my favorites. It's called When Things Fall Apart by mm -hmm. Pema Chodron. Mm -hmm. And she's kind of witty. She's a Buddhist nun, but she puts beautiful perspective on exactly what we're talking about. It's, you know, expecting life to fall apart. It's part of being human. Lovely. We're all in it together. It's about finding the magic as things crumble and come back together. And it's, it's that beautiful idea of that's just the natural order of things. Things fall apart. They come back together. They fall apart. We see that with the trees. Someone shared this beautiful quote the other day of, you know, all the trees are lo losing their leaves, but not one of them seems to care. And I'm like, oh, that's it. That's it. So I think that book is helpful for anyone at any stage of their healing journey especially if you're starting to feel like, oh dear, this is scary. This is out of my control. It provides such a stability and this beautiful sense of, of hope in a, without bright siding. It's also just a reminder, I think, because I think intuitively all, we all know that, but it just gets yeah. lost in comparison and what we're told by mainstream medicine and media that we get these diagnoses. But I think we know internally that we go through seasons and it's going to be good times. It's going to be bad times. But if you're persistent and you keep going, you'll make it through. Mm -hmm. I love that resource as well. What's your go-to breakfast? So it sounds like you love a range of different foods now. So I would love yeah. to hear what your typical breakfasts are like. 
Yeah. So I follow my whims and I, I tend to get pretty hooked on like certain textures and colors for what sometimes feels like months and months and months. And then oh, change my mind to something else. But right now I've really been into making these egg porridges. So it's like rice flour, egg, butter. Sometimes I add spices and make it more savory. Um, like adding like roasted garlic in, or I'll add like mm. mushy cooked zucchini, but there's something really nice about a very mushy warming bowl of porridge in the morning. And then always with some kind of orange juice and love coffee. It's been, I think, demonized unrightfully so, but can be such a helpful, actually really helpful for the, the antihistamine effect, but even just for the cellular energy effect and balancing hormones in the sense of if we can feel a little bit more dopamine, maybe we can feel a little bit more inspired. Maybe we can feel a little bit more focused. So I, I keep it pretty simple right now, but yeah, I'd say that's my go-to. Sounds delicious, especially, I don't know where you are, but the weather is turning here in England. So it's yeah. getting colder. So that sounds like the perfect breakfast for me. Yes. Same here. We have snow up in the mountains and, you know, for a while I was, I tend to actually really like cold food. I wonder if you can relate. I just prefer cold food. Definitely but... not. My stomach okay, will well... just immediately tense up. So we're different in that. <gasps> wow! Okay. Well now for maybe the first time in my life, I'm craving like warming stews and porridges and like just, yeah, comfort, which is, I'm always open to learning more because I think part of the journey is realizing, okay, sometimes you'll crave certain foods and your body just quite can't quite handle them yet, but not taking it personally and just saying, Oh, okay, body, you know, I know you, I know you'd like to eat some gluten and it's just not working out for you today. No big deal. What, what can, what's a little bit kinder on the, on the intestines. So that's been part of it too, realizing that oftentimes I will have to scale back and that's okay. And then I find these very simple nourishing foods that are almost like adult baby foods that I actually love. And then I start craving them and they're on repeat. So yeah, hence the porridge. Amazing. What's one thing that you do daily to stay in hormonal harmony? You know, I've started dancing regularly and now I almost set the intention to kind of dance through the day. So maybe I'll just wiggle between <laughs> calls or I'll be making my porridge dance in a little bit. Um, but I noticed- You can dance and do the tapping at the same time. You could. Yeah. And just <laughs> shaking. And it's something about moving the body in unique ways. For me, it, I notice my brain, my, my thought patterns, my brain feels differently when I'm staying in a more playful mode. Um, because I can, I can quickly fall back into some old pathways that are hyper serious, you know, very focused, like don't talk to me. I'm working kind of a mood, but if I'm dancing through it and I'm, I'm almost making light of my own human experience things look different I might even you know choose different things the rest of the day choose to work in a different way write about something different for the content I'm working on so yeah that's an amazing question can I ask you the same question yeah I feel dancing as well and to me it's honoring more of that feminine flow yeah. whereas um, being like a business owner and having health issues and being like a type a personality could be in your masculine quite a lot of the day. So that tells me that dancing is relieving, relieving your, um, or releasing some trapped energy and it's just getting you back, especially if you're moving your hips around, then that's definitely the feminine. And then that might make you more creative later in the day and make you more empathetic, or maybe you're writing in a different style because you're tapping into that intuitive feminine energy and wisdom. Exactly. Yeah. And even just in terms of reclaiming the body, I know we touched on this briefly, but you know, EFT is one technique, but we're solidifying certain thought patterns with everything that we do. So like you said, if we're shaking our hips and feeling like kind of feminine and, and feeling good in our bodies, ah, oh, wow, we might actually congratulate ourselves or, you know, see someone else and see them with such a, see their beauty and maybe, you know, not judge them. So it's, it's this beautiful ripple effect. You change one thing, you change one thought, you start dancing, everything gets brighter. And it comes back yeah. to that whole, <laughs> like taking inspiration from children as well. You see them, they just start bursting out into song and dance and they're so free. So yeah, it would make sense. But we want to reconnect back to our roots and our nature and just living a human, human life. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, the last question, I won't keep you much longer, is where can people find more from you online? So I'm sure that they love your bubbly personality and want to learn more. You're one of my favorite people to follow on Instagram. So please tell them where they can find more and work with you if they want to. Yeah, I'm at Living Roots Wellness. I'm most active on Instagram, but actually getting pretty excited about a tapping membership that I just launched. So that's called tappingwitht.com. And the whole idea is basically a tapping sequence for everything that comes up in the process of being a human that's trying to feel better. So that's been really fun because my emphasis there is also creating a community of people that are healing, but they're not sick, you know? they're working on something, but they're more identified with where they're going. And it's, that's, that's, that's it right there. Realizing we're not alone, that we have power, that it's maybe 99% about your thoughts and starting to feel the effects when we start to change those. So yeah, I, um, that's, those are the two best places to find so it's me. Like an and also on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your page is so informative. So I'm definitely going to be checking out the membership as well. And I'll link to all of the things that you've mentioned today in the episode show notes. So anyone listening, don't worry about having to remember them. They'll all be included. And I love the name tapping with T. Very, very, um, very cool. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to thank you again. I love connecting with you. I would love to stay in touch and thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thanks for having me, Vivian. This is such a great way to start the day.